Thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, as always, appreciate this opportunity. Um, a couple things to update you and then we'll get into the presentation. Uh, last week, we held uh, three listening sessions uh, with staff facilitated by various GARE team members. Um, these listening sessions created a space for really honest sharing um, with some of our city employees in a space where I could really listen to feelings and concerns and, and ideas about racial equity and, and the recent events both locally and throughout our nation. Um, I found it extremely val valuable and very powerful um, and to hear from some of our, our employees and we will uh, be figuring out what the next steps are. I just wanted to thank all of the, the staff that were able to participate in the, the various GARE team members who facilitated uh, the sessions. As far as our unsung heroes today, I uh, wanna recognize uh, some people in our uh, building planning and uh, code enforcement department. As, as you all know, construction is one of the keys to our recovery. And we really have three unsung heroes in the building division. And so they are Bill Main, Mark Garcia, and Azalea. Miranda. Uh, Mark and Bill are both division managers on the inspection services team and Azalea is a principal office specialist. Uh, these three, along with other supervisors and team members, pulled together all the new procedures to keep inspectors working efficiently and safely. Uh, they pulled together uh, uh, safety training procedures and obviously provided all of the staff with PPE, they, as we've talked about before, promoted new technologies for remote inspections and digitized inspection uh, notices. Uh, there's a pretty significant deployment process that happens in the morning time. If you're here in City Hall, you can see it happening. It's very impressive. Um, and they've just done a wonderful job in, in making sure that we're uh, doing our best to keep up with all of this inspection demands in the city. Uh, between May 4th and June 12th, this team handled nearly 15,000 inspection accounts. Um, and I just wanna mention that these three individuals in particular were not only nominated by, by other city staff, but we received some letters of recognition from our permit customers. So just wanna show a very quick uh, a video here, uh, just to put some faces to the names that I mentioned. So thanks again uh, to, uh, and, uh, to Bill and Mark and Azalea and the rest of the inspection staff. Really appreciate all of the work that's going on out there. So we'll uh, jump into the presentations. Uh, Lee will be heading up the EOC update today. You'll also be uh, getting a financial recovery and intergovernmental relations update from Benna Chang. And then Jim Orball and, and Jackie and, and John will be providing an update on our COVID homeless response and our Beautify San Jose response and how we're weaving those together. And then Lee will also provide uh, a little bit of a, a preview of what work we're going to be doing in July and also how we propose to be able to communicate with the mayor and the council and the public uh, during July as well. So Lee, if you could take it from here. Thank you, Dave. And on behalf of Kip Harkness and I, I want to thank everyone for their, we, uh, their work in the EOC and the organization the past week um, as we've continued to focus on serving our community um, um, aggressively and effectively with the COVID crisis. Um, this past week, um, we've continued the food distribution program with no gaps um, for our community. This work, work week, we served uh, roughly 2.7 million 
people, which is a slight decrease. Um, and we've continued to see that over the past few weeks if people have started to um, had the opportunity to go back to work. We've continued the site preparation for the temporary housing sites that you'll hear um, uh, a little bit later. Um, and we've continued to keep our people safe um, and the public safe uh, while they do their work. And this includes increased uh, decontamination work at city facilities um, um, and as uh, additional planning as we start to bring some of our facilities back online with the purchase of PPE and additional janitorial services. Our local assistant branch has been working on business outreach and support. Uh, this last week, they uh, conducted a webinar on Main Street uh, lending program and finished a, a second short video on financing um, of your business. And lastly, uh, just for the roadmap update, our emergency uh, public information office within the EOC has continued to keep the information um, information to our residents, specifically around some of our park openings and the city's alfresco program. And then last week, we um, were asked by council to report back on some of the construction sites um, where um, there have been positive uh, tests related to COVID. Um, in total, 15 construction sites um, in the city have uh, reported that positive case of COVID um, since con construction resumed several weeks ago. This includes five within the past week. Per county guidance, all of these sites uh, have been cleared except for two. Uh, the city has halted inspections um, at, those, at those two sites, however. Um, at one of the sites, we've received word yesterday of an addi additional two positive tests. Um, and so we will continue to follow the protocols, pro protocols strictly um, and not inspect those sites um, that report positive cases to protect our own workforce. Um, in the event of confirmed cases of COVID-19 at any job site, the following uh, must take place. Um, we immediately remove uh, the infected individuals from a uh, job site uh, with directions to seek medical care. Uh, each location of a infected worker um, must be decontaminated um, and sanitized by an outside vendor um, certified in hazmat cleanups um, and work with all locations uh, that this individual may have been as a part of the logistics um, or supply chain of the construction site. Um, and lastly, the county public health department must be notified immediately and any in, uh, additional requirements per county uh, health officials must be completed, including full compliance with any tracing efforts that were outlined yesterday by the county. So that is our main EOC update. I'll be back later to talk about our focus over the legislative break, uh, July over the summer, as well as how we'll keep in contact with um, the council. But I will hand it over to Benna Chang to talk about some of our financial recovery updates and our focused work this summer. Thanks, Lee. Um, first slide, please. So Benna Chang, the Director of Intergovernmental Relations for the city. I wanted to give you guys first uh, a federal update as you know, since um, Congress and the president signed three and a half packages, really the progress has stalled. Currently, Congress is negotiating the fourth package. Uh, recently also, the House Democrats have introduced um, an infrastructure bill and really started transitioning the conversation to economic recovery. Next slide, please. On the fourth package, um, as you know, the House passed the HEROES Act as we mentioned yesterday, this is a $3 trillion package that covers a wide range of activities, including extending the pandemic unemployment insurance, additional state and local government assistance, and direct stimulus payments to taxpayers. The president continues to advocate for payroll tax credits, but the White House has also recently signaled willingness to continue extending the pandemic unemployment insurance. And then on the Senate Republican side, they have really taken a wait and see approach. Uh, Senate Republicans continue to talk about additional business liability protection as being key for any next package. And then we recently also learned that Senator Rubio is forming a bipartisan work group to talk about additional small business programs and assistance. Next slide. Um, as in the meantime, as I mentioned, uh, the House is scheduled to vote this week on the a Moving Forward Act. This is a $1.5 trillion infrastructure package. 
that includes funding for a lot of traditional infrastructure projects, including those listed on your screen. Uh, we don't anticipate that the Senate will be taking action on an infrastructure proposal, and really we will wait and see until after the November election to see if Congress will want to take action. On the fourth package, uh, we are anticipating that there will be additional work that happens in the July, July after the July 4th break. Next slide. State side, the governor uh, signed last night the state budget, um, and this budget deal closed a $54 billion deficit. The budget anticipates additional federal funding, disperse some payments, and significantly uses the state's budget reserves. Even though this was generally a budget of cuts, there is still investment in some key areas for the city, which includes $550 million from the state's share of the coronavirus relief funds from the CARES Act on homelessness activities. And this is actually a little bit broader than just hotel motel acquisition and also includes tiny homes and other homelessness supports. Um, it also included $300 million in state general fund money for round two of the housing assistance, uh, homeless housing assistance program or HAP. And then finally, it also includes $50 million for a continual assistance for public safety power shutoff events. I just really wanted to thank the mayor for leading the big city mayor's coalition and advocating very successfully for the housing funding this year. Next slide, please. Uh, we also wanted to give council a quick snapshot of some of the other state activities that we've been working on around the regulations and policy side. Um, we have been working very hard on a couple of revenue items one of them was protecting excess educational revenue augmentation fund money. This is a property tax dollars that flow to um, the county and also to cities and special districts. Uh, we've also been working on some changes to um, the proposed changes at the Board of Equalization around property tax valuations on the revenue side. Uh, COVID-19 has also um, delayed some of the activities that we've been working on and that have required us to ask the state for additional timeline extensions. So this includes AB 900 projects, as well as some new requirements around organic waste and enforcement. So we've been working closely with regulators and the state legislature to ask for extensions on those. And then finally, on the regulatory um, front, we have been working very closely with the county and the alcohol beverage control on outdoor dining uh, restrictions. And so with that, um, that concludes our report and we will pass it on to Jim and Jackie for the next section. Good morning, Mayor, members of the Council, Jim Ortbald, Deputy City Manager and EOC Operations Section Coordinator. We're here this morning to describe the EOC response to the declared shelter crisis during COVID and our efforts to address encampment trash and debris, blight, illegal dumping, and protest damage and graffiti as these challenges have become more acute during the many months of COVID. In the EOC, we've stood up three specific branches to address these important issues. The Homeless Support Branch, led by Reagan Henninger, the Emergency Interim Housing Branch, led by Matt Kano and James Stagey, and the newest branch just stood up to initially address protest damage is now focused on addressing growing encampment trash and debris and citywide litter and blight issues. Jackie morales Ferrand, our housing director, will give the first part of the presentation and frame our COVID-19 shelter crisis, crisis response within the context of the community plan to end homelessness. The community plan was almost complete in March when COVID hit, Today's presentation is not intended to fully address the community plan. That's expected to come in front of the council in late August. We're contexting it today so the council can see how key parts of the city's COVID shelter response align with strategy three of the community plan. After Jackie presents, I'll then provide a focused discussion around the Beautify SJ response including services that were initially suspended and have since been restarted, and the new pilot plans and efforts aimed at addressing the growing encampment trash and other blight-related issues. So I'll turn it over to Jackie for the next slide. 
Thank you, Jim. According to our 2019 homeless census, there are over 6,000 homeless individuals in San Jose. 84% are unsheltered and living in unhabitable conditions. Next slide. <clears throat> During the last five years, the focus of our efforts have been on creating a coordinated response, which includes the city, the county, nonprofits, destination home, and private sector partners who focused our efforts on solving homelessness by providing housing. New programs included the first permanent supportive housing development in San Jose, a rapid rehousing program that provides rental subsidies, and a homeless prevention program that before COVID-19 was serving approximately 1,000 families and individuals. Because all the data was being finally collected into one system, which is our HMIS system, the data showed us that despite these shifts in providing housing for people, for every one person we housed, three new people were becoming homeless. And again, this is pre-COVID-19. We also heard loud and clear from both the city, from both the city council, our housed and unhoused residents, that supportive housing solutions were taking too long, and we needed to include interim housing solutions. Next slide. The new community plan to end homelessness includes a strategy to improve the quality of life for unsheltered into individuals and create healthy neighborhoods for all. While Jim Zarso stated, the focus of this pre presentation is not on the community plan, I wanted to highlight that the community plan continues to be our roadmap in developing and implementing solutions even when we are responding to COVID-19. Next slide. <coughs> What has made our current situation particularly challenging and dynamic is that we now have the COVID pandemic on top of the pre-existing shelter crisis requiring responsive and urgent action. On March 16th, Santa Clara County issued a shelter in place order for residents in the county. The CDC also issued guidance as it related to unsheltered people with a request to, sh to shelter as many people as possible. Given the large number of unsheltered people in our county and city, and despite our efforts to stand up over a thousand temporary shelter beds, it was not clearly enough to shelter all the 5,000 unsheltered residents in our city. And so we have been following the CDC guidance and we immediately suspended abatements of encampments. Next slide. In looking at strategy three, which again was to improve the quality of life for our unsheltered individuals and to create healthy neighborhoods, this strategy also set out some goals. Two of them, which are included in our COVID-19 response. One is to double the number of year-round shelter, in addition to increasing street outreach and hygiene services. Um, as I've mentioned already, we've added over 1,100 beds, but because of the need to thin the shelters out, the total capacity that we actually added was 605. We also focused another part of our response on providing out outreach and hygiene and sanitation stations to larger encampments. And I'll explain more about that strategy in this presentation. Next, uh, next slide, please. As Jim has already shared, the EOC created three branches that are all responding to implementing a COVID-19 response. And I'm going to focus on the homeless support branch and the emergency interim housing branch. Next slide. Um, when COVID-19 hit, the housing department immediately reached out to the county to develop one coordinated plan. We meet weekly with the county destination home to discuss challenges and solutions. And Reagan, our deputy director, is actually embedded in the county EOC in order to ensure that we have close communication and we are aligned. We also, this effort also ensures that we don't duplicate our efforts, we leverage our funding, and again, we're communicating regularly on how we can improve our response. This slide highlights our coordinated, again, countywide response. One of the first actions we took was to create a shelter hotline. Prior to COVID-19, a person had to check each individual shelter to find out if there was space available. 
Now a person just needs to call the hotline and the person will receive a call within 24 hours um, or one business day. One of the complaints that I've heard is that the person didn't get a recall back. The county calls are logged and tracked. So when we do receive a specific complaint, the county is able to track what the actual response was and to follow up with the individual. Another concern I hear is that the person wasn't actually offered anything. Um, motels and hotels are being used for vulnerable residents. And therefore, if the caller doesn't meet the definition of vulnerable, the person is offered space at one of our congregate shelters. Often, the caller rejects that shelter option because their preferred option is the motel room. And so it isn't the case that we're not offering an option. It's often the case that the option that is being provided is not one that the caller wants. Secondly, we've expanded our shelter system. Um, again, one of the first needs we identified was the need to thin out our shelters to allow for sh social distancing. The city opened Parkside Hall, South Hall, and the family shelter at Camden Community Center. The county has taken the lead in leasing hotels throughout the county. Almost half are located in the city, but the remaining rooms are located in six other cities in the county. One question I've been often asked is why are there still empty hotel rooms? The county is keeping 68 hotel rooms um, available for people who need isolation or need to be quarantined. This is offered to both housed and unhoused residents. Approximately 50% of these rooms have been used by housed residents who did not have a safe place to isolate. Once a new hotel is located and opened up, the county systematically uh, begins to fill it up, and once it is filled, they often remain over 90% occupied. Next slide. The interim housing, the emergency interim housing branch is moving forward with the three interim housing sites with our first site on Monterey Road at Burnell scheduled to open up in late July. And we've given you a presentation on this particular strategy. Next slide. Our final strategy that we've been using is to, um, and, and it's because it's in response to COVID-19 and because we do not have sufficient shelter to meet the needs of our unhoused residents, the city is providing hygiene solutions at our larger encampments to keep people safe. We have developed a three-pronged approach. The first approach includes hygiene, which has hand washing stations, portable restrooms, mobile showers, and trash pickup. You'll hear more about trash pickup from Jim. The second part of this strategy is street outreach. You may recall that we've had better outcomes from the PATH outreach teams downtown because they are able to focus their efforts with regular visits and communication with downtown homeless individuals. By providing regular focused outreach to selected encampments, we hope to achieve similar results. These outreach teams provide COVID-19 information and support residents to keep their areas clean and to practice social distancing. And finally, the, next, the last piece of this approach is to provide housing solutions. The housing solutions include access to the shelter hotline, uh, housing assessments to ensure that we, if, if we identify somebody who's living in an encampment, we get them signed up for our housing programs, and finally, under development is our new housing program problem solving approach. And with that, um, there are some people we can get off the streets by looking at other creative solutions where they might be able to stay with a friend or family member. But the goal in housing problem solutions is to get somebody off the street as quickly as possible. We also hope to expand uh, our outreach by providing enhanced outreach. We wanna include a mental health a worker to provide support to our residents who live in encampments who are having and experiencing challenge, challenging situations. And finally, Jim will discuss a proposed waste management service that we hope to implement um, very shortly. And with that, I will turn it over to Jim. The next slide, please. 
so the EOC has been scaling its beautify SJ response during COVID based upon what the county order has allowed and what we've thought was prudent. Stopping the spread of COVID was the highest priority by far in the March and April timeframe. As the county public orders evolved and the city gained a better understanding and capability on how to provide certain services safely, Beautify SJ response has been scaling up. And what I'll go through now will cover both the impacts of the scale down during March and April and the scaling back up that is now well underway around blight, illegal dumping and encampment trash. Next slide, please. So in March, under the first county order and public health guidance, the city continued certain basic Beautify SJ services, but suspended others. And the notice sus suspensions are encampment abatements and the associated cleanings, neighborhood dumpster days, the rapid illegal dumping team, and the SJ bridge cleaning program. You can see that on the table on this slide. Unfortunately, um, you know, this has resulted in impacts uh, to our city um, in, in critical areas such as increased service request backlogs to illegal dumping. Uh, in addition to that, we've experienced increase, increased trash from encampments. Abatements were the main approach to cleaning and encampments. Without that occurring, we're having to develop new ways to address, address trash at encampments. And then increased resident spring cleaning. With people being home at shelter in place, they're tackling garage projects, backyard projects, and we're finding that illegal dumping ending up on our streets. And then we also had to address protest damage and graffiti cleanup. And these same teams that are doing the other work had to pivot to this type of work. So this certainly didn't put us in a good position to address all that we need to but we are uh, rescoping our efforts and getting focus. So let me go to the next slide. So this slide aims to scope and frame the large widespread nature of both the homeless encampment challenge and the illegal dumping problem. The map on the left notes the 5,000 unsheltered residents in our city that Jackie referenced earlier and the thousands of complaints the city has received since December, 2019 about encampments, which are denoted by the triangles on the map on the left. Many of them represent multiple complaints. And the map on the right identifies the locations of over 7,600 San Jose 311 complaints on illegal dumping received since December of 2019. Next slide, please. So this slide shows the severity and complexity of the challenge, but the problems intersect yet are distinct and not the same. Both are individually complex and have various root causes that are not easily identified or solved. They're widespread and they touch every part of our city, although it's clear certain parts of our city are much harder hit. However, just prioritizing the hardest hit areas of the city does not adequately address the challenge, leaving staff in a whack-a-mole response mode when dealing with the continuous flow of complaints. To date, the challenges have far exceeded the resources to adequately address the needs, resulting in gaps and insufficient service frequency. It's forced us into a reactive mode, reactive mode leaving our city with visibly poor conditions. Next slide, please. So staff recognized during COVID that normal department structures and approaches were not capable to address this complex challenge and a new organizational response was needed. Much like we did on emergency interim housing, we stood up a Beautify SJ branch in the EOC to restart uh, suspended services, to coordinate services better, and to pivot towards the protest damage and graffiti response as well. More recently, we focused this effort on encampment trash and illegal dumping backlogs and developing a long-term plan after we move past kind of EOC response mode. The team is being led by Rick Scott, Deputy Director in DOT. Olympia Williams from PRNS is the operations coordinator. Sarah Zarate from the city manager's office is the plans coordinator. Uh, Amory Brandt from the city manager's office is the data analyst. And John Geyer from ESD 
is our waste management and disposal, disposal expert. The team literally has met every day over the past two weeks to work the problem and address the urgency of the situation. Next slide, please. So the branch has identified three interrelated goals. The first goal is to immediately ramp up resources and increase emergency trash pickup where needed and to develop a systematic waste disposal approach for encampment residents. I think it's important to understand this point. Almost every one of our 1 million residents receives garbage and recycling services on a weekly basis. The reality is our 5,000 unsheltered residents don't own a rent property and don't have corresponding garbage service. Nonetheless, they generate trash and recycling, but with no effective way to contain or dispose of it. Imagine what each one of our streets would look like if the garbage haulers that serve our residences each week did not come to pick up, and further imagine if we did not have carts to put the garbage in and just push the loose garbage to the curb. At homeless encampments, the city is left with the task of responding on an ad hoc basis to collect and pick up loose trash, bags, and all types of debris. It's not an efficient system. During COVID, we've been responding to some 60 plus encampments on a somewhat regular basis because we recognize trash is a daily and weekly occurrence. More to come on the next slide. The second goal here is to restart all Beautify SJ services and better coordinate and calibrate the right mix and most impactful group of them. And then finally, over the next six months, we need to redefine the most important and needed Beautify SJ services that will create the best results and deliver them more efficiently and develop a plan to address the resource and service gaps to really know what it takes to have a city that looks good, where we can actually get out in front of the problem or at least stay even with it and ultimately turn service delivery back into our normal city organization. Next slide, please. So this slide identifies specific actions and objectives the branch will deploy over the next eight weeks and then continue through the end of December 2020, the time frame that we have for the use of the coronavirus relief funds that are allocated to this activity. I'll highlight a few of them. Uh, we're going to be investing those coronavirus relief funds to support encampment sanitation while we have suspended abatements, which were the main cleanup tool for encampments pre-COVID. We're going to figure out a more effective and efficient regular trash container and disposal system for the 60 plus encampment sites. We're going to deploy a dumpster pilot program immediately at large encampments where large amounts of trash is being generated. We're going to safely redeploy services during COVID stage six and seven so that all Beautify SJ services are active, coordinated, and providing services. We're going to identify and prioritize hot spots from a need and equity lens. And then over the long term, we want to pilot, measure, and learn from goal one and two activities and clearly redefine the program purpose, goals, and measures of success that allow us to identify the service delivery gaps and to recommend a unified resource and service plan that achieves success, a clean city. Next slide, please. And I only have a couple more. I just want to update the city council about the city's approach to encampments during COVID. Uh, certainly between the city and county, we're trying to temporarily shelter as many unsheltered people as possible, but we're well short of the 5,000 beds needed. Based upon CDC and county health guidance to limit movement of people, especially those unsheltered, abatements are suspended. This is to support the county's efforts to COVID test and trace positive cases among those in, in encampments and to provide isolation to avoid spread. But certain conditions create public safety hazards and this protocol aims to address public rights of way like streets, sidewalks, and trails that are in camp, blocked, or impassable. The recent Guadalupe River Trail outreach, cleaning, and clearing of the trail is an effort to maintain access to public rights of way while addressing large amounts of trash and debris and not forcing long distance relocations of unsheltered people. The next slide just gives a quick example of kind of what we're dealing with. The, these pictures, kind of the upper left one shows uh, green bags that are distributed by the Beautify SJ team as a way to 
contain trash, uh, make it easier for unsheltered uh, to place their trash and to make pickup more orderly. The bottom pictures show trash that's loose. Uh, it's very labor intensive to pick up, hence the need for a more organized kind of waste management system. Uh, last slide is just really concluding. Uh, obviously we have, next slide please. Uh, just had, we have a major uh, effort underway around trying to shelter as many people as possible, outreach to as many people as possible, have conditions in the encampments be as sanitary as possible, and then to try and address the beautify SJ and trash elements of it as well. That concludes this presentation, and then I'll turn it over to Regan Henninger, who's going to give a brief report on the um, emergency trailers uh, that were uh, sent to the city. So I'll turn it over to Reagan. Good morning. I appreciate the opportunity to provide an overview of the trailer program and why the decision was made to demobilize the site and transition people to hotels. Next slide. On March 20th, the city received 104 trailers from the state with less than 24 hours notice of their arrival. The decision was made to deliver the trailers to the Kelly Park parking lot. The location was selected because it's city controlled and there was no time to negotiate a lease with a private entity. The lot was also closed due to the Happy Hollow Park closure and Kelly Park closure. And the lot size was large enough to accommodate 104 RVs. Although the city had never used RV trailers as an emergency shelter or housing solution for homeless, the EOC and housing department staff were hopeful the trailers could provide a creative solution to this unprecedented health crisis. Only two of the trailers were immediately usable. 90 of the trailers required repair, some more extensive than others, and 14 were and remain unusable. The city was also informed by Cal OES that the trailers could only be used to provide non-congregate shelter options for homeless people who are either COVID positive or presumably exposed to the virus, or high risk per the CDC guidelines. It was decided to use the trailers to serve the high risk, vulnerable, homeless individuals. At the time, back in March, the county and the state were setting up a 250 bed field medical center at the Santa Clara Convention Center that was to be used for COVID positive. So it was determined that serving the vulnerable population was the best use of this resource. Next slide. So there were significant setup and operations involved. It took two months to get the trailers repaired and placed into working order. The setup and repairs needed were significant. The 90 damaged trailers included things like damaged cabinets, missing cabinets, missing beds, broken appliances, missing gas canisters, missing propane tanks, damaged hookups for electric, sewer, and water, and even holes in the side and roofs of some trailers. Some were missing vent cover covers and others missing plumbing fixtures. We also had to build an entire temporary utility infrastructure. The Kelly Park Happy Hollow parking lot did not have electrical or plumbing systems. The trailers required plumbing and electrical hookups to be habitable and provide the safety and security needed to house such vulnerable individuals. The above ground infrastructure for potable water and sewage didn't include showers because the amount of water required for showers would overwhelm this temporary sewage system. And secondly, many of the trailers, as I mentioned, did not come with propane tanks needed to heat water for hot showers. So we had to bring in a portable shower trailer. 
generators also provided the site with electricity as trenching and dropping electrical was not appropriate for this temporary site. The other on-site operations needed included 24 hour a day, seven day a week security with six officers on duty for every shift due to the large nature of the site. An on-site operator also on site 24 hours a day, seven days a week and daily maintenance of the RVs and the temporary infrastructure. Next slide. Once the site was opened, we had significant challenges and client safety issues. In the first three weeks of operations, there were daily maintenance events and malfunctions of either the temporary infrastructure of the trailers themselves, resulting in concerns of whether the site was cost effective to operate, but most importantly, whether or not it was safe for our most vulnerable residents. There were daily heat and hot water challenges. Participants were required to walk to the temporary shower trailer. And for those with breathing, heart or mobility issues, walking to these trailers to access basic needs was often challenging. There were even door malfunctions on the trailers. Two guests and one operation staff got locked inside the trailers due to the doors malfunctioning. The plumbing and sewer issues were constant, if not daily. In the three weeks we were there, there were eight major plumbing repairs, including overflow of sewage into bathtubs and overflow of sewage in the exterior holding tanks. And yes, that photo on the right is exactly what you think it is. And the site had significant issues with power as well. On May 26, the generators that powered the site ran out of fuel and for four hours during a severe heat advisory, we were out of power, which meant vulnerable individuals with health conditions had no power, including air conditioning. Two days later on May 28th, the generators ran out of fuel again and we were out of power for three hours. Again, vulnerable individuals with no air conditioning. There were even fires on site or near the site that meant real critical safety issues for our vulnerable residents. On May 27th and 29th, grass fires occurred in the surrounding area near Happy Hollow Park, causing significant smoke, resulting in challenges for participants with COPD, asthma, and other breathing issues. And more significantly, on June 1st, an unoccupied trailer caught fire and was destroyed in just seven minutes. And 10 minutes later, the two trailers on either side were also destroyed. The trailers were unoccupied and thankfully no one was hurt. And the cause of the fire was an electrical man malfunction within the trailer. These significant maintenance challenges and repairs, along with client safety concerns, were the driving factors in the decision to find an alternative use for the trailers and transition those vulnerable residents into hotels. Next slide. Since opening on May 14th, the site served a total of 39 households, consisting of, of both individuals and couples. Of this total, nine households left the program on their own with concerns about their safety and comfort of the trailers. The average age of the clients we served was 64. All the clients had underlying health conditions that included COPD, severe asthma, or other significant breathing issues, heart disease, cancer, hepatitis C, liver disease, infections causing difficult in walking and mobility. The result of these underlying health conditions is often mobility challenges which are difficult in a site that was this large. Abode, our on-site service provider, found many clients had trouble walking the distance to the showers or even walking to take their trash out. And some clients struggled to manage the stairs in and out of their trailers. At the time of the site closure, 
30 of the trailers were occupied with 35 people. Clients were notified on a Wednesday that the site would be closing and Abode worked with individuals over six days to help them plan, prepare, and transition and choose a location that best suited their needs. The following Monday, all the clients were transitioned to hotels and were provided transportation to hotels. A total of 35 people, eight dogs and one turtle made it safely to hotels. And one important thing to know is that we did not have a loss in capacity due to the closing. The housing department is funding the operations of 90 hotel rooms. Next slide. So the EOC, we have been exploring what a long-term relocation of the trailers might take. We've done some initial analysis of what would be required. We would need a significant parcel of land to properly and safely space out the trailers. We would need infrastructure and utilities that are specifically designed for RVs. And the initial estimate from Public Works is approximately 8.2 million. The combined challenges of locating a large parcel along with the significant costs mean the administration is recommending an alternative use for the trailers. Next slide. Well, what's next? We're still working on that. The city does not have title to the trailers. San Jose's EOC has made a request to the state that they take back the trailers and reimburse the city for our costs. Alternatively, and perhaps most promising, we've identified a local nonprofit interested in taking the trailers and using them for small scale safe parking programs located throughout the county. And we're currently seeking guidance from the state on how to make that possible. And finally, although we're closing the site, I would like to acknowledge the tremendous hard work and collaboration of many teams. Specifically, the housing department, Kelly Hemphill and Steve Pendleton, and our mighty team of building inspectors, Sean, Roger, and Guido. And then also our public works department, Rich Ramirez, Ryan Rucker, and Walter Lynn Abode Services for providing outstanding on-site services as well as taking a leap of faith with us. And then finally, the Office of Supportive Housing at the county who worked so closely with us to make sure our residents were transferred safely to hotels. And this concludes the report on the trailer program. We're complete as well. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I think Lee had a few more things to say. Um, yeah. Lee, sorry, you have, yep, sorry, having trouble unmute myself. Um, so we wanted to end the presentation with a little bit of what our monthly or what the month priorities look like for us as well as how we intend to stay in communication with the council. Um, and so over the month of July, we will be maintaining our, our emergency response at all levels that we have thus far um, and continue to stop the, the spread of COVID-19 and support our most at-risk individuals. And this will um, mean a very active EOC um, and focusing, continuing to focus on the key efforts around our food distribution program, all of the housing work that was just outlined, as well as uh, continuing uh, the local assistance effort around um, our residents, businesses, nonprofits, and continuing to fill out our community engagement strategies as we uh, have a huge need to engage our community um, but have the constraints of the, the COVID-19 crisis. How do we go ahead and, and engage that? And then um, as well as continue to coordinate with the county related to the isolation program that was mentioned yesterday. And, and just uh, we will be continuing to work on our testing as well, just so that I can update you all um, getting texts from, from Rob Lloyd and Ann Tran uh, that they had a very successful meeting with Verily this morning and Verily will be uh, moving their hours of operation to, to much later in the day as well as 
um, adding a weekend um, to that site for additional testing. So that is uh, the information I have. We will report back next week um, through info memo on that when appropriate. And then lastly for the month ahead is um, our city organization and the Powered by People uh, movement need to really continue to focus on the, the returning to the workplace and, and keeping our staff and the public safe um, as we continue that transition and then start resuming some city services that had um, stopped with the continuity of operations plan and ensuring those are delivered in a very safe and manageable way. Over the course of the month, um, uh, we will not, uh, we currently don't have scheduled council meetings. Uh, the Emergency Operations Center will be producing an info memo to the mayor and council every Wednesday. Um, in addition, um, as we start to take down the liaison branch and put that back into the organization, uh, mayor and council engagement will come directly uh, from the EOC directors, so both Kip and I, uh, and we will both be accessible to you. So we will reach out to you when necessary if anything uh, comes up, but you should feel free and contact uh, either Kip, myself, or Dave uh, directly um, over the course of July. And then if anything else comes up in the way of new information or, or anything operationally changes or we have uh, new guidance or need to bring back the council, the administration will request a special meeting of uh, the council over the summer break. And so that concludes staff's presentation. We're available for questions and I'll hand it back over to Dave if he has anything else to say. Yeah, thanks, Lee. Uh, thank you to the entire team. Um, appreciate all the hard work that's going on. And uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. I know today's presentation was, was a little lengthy, but uh, a lot of information to share with you all. And we're available for questions.